All right, we're gonna get started with some tea. Actually, I love that little Yeti cup. <laughs> tea is a very important part to painting, at least to my painting. I think a lot of people are like that. Really enjoy coffee, but tea is really my drink of choice. So I'm starting out here with some just basic dark marks. And I'm really looking for some of my anchor points so that I can kind of keep track of my drawing as I go. So I do have uh, uh, some, uh, a drawing down already that, that I had done just to kind of as a guide, but you know, mistakes can be made, so you really need to pay attention to what you're doing and not just rely on uh, your preliminary sketches. I'm going through the darks first. I really like going that way because I have um, my uh, my panel is already toned. It's, it's toned to a neutral uh, sienna and... Uh, so it's kind of at a mid-tone already, so adding these darks really immediately starts bringing out shape and form to the, to the figure. And plus it kind of gives just a direction for your brain to go. You can just move from lights to darks. But it's hard to tell on the video, but it's a lot easier under studio lights to see that the, uh, the dark colors are actually shifting in in uh, temperature. The darkest darks are kind of a bluish, but just above that is uh, very red. And you'll see a little bit of that as I get start going into the mid-tones, just how saturated, how saturated those mid-tones are. The blocking in at least for my painting. I know some uh, some artists that their block in just looks very abstract, but for me, it's really important to get these, to get the block in um, uh, as close to where you're gonna get these, uh, these shapes in the end figure. Because for me, if you don't make the mistakes, you don't have to fix them. No, I don't like fixing mistakes. I just like doing it right the first time. And getting your shadows in early really helps with that. And I think I am mixing up some of my, getting ready for some of these midtones. And these midtones, I'm really going hot, like a very, very red in in these midtones in the face here, because uh, the lighting setup that I had with my model uh, has a uh, very warm, very yellowish light, um, and then a uh, very cool uh, backlight that's opposite. Give some some strong drama. Well, what that means is that the reds are gonna appear in the shadows. So that's why I have these dark mid-tones, very, very red, you can see coming through here. And of course, this starts as, when I start getting into the yellows and the blues, these uh, reds are gonna come down a little bit in saturation, but right now it's like, Wow, is his forehead bleeding? It's like, yes, it's bleeding through his skin because skin is has blood in it. Because our brains are so trained to uh, recognize skin tones, it's really hard to uh, wrap our brains around the actual colors that we're looking at when it comes to uh, the skin, because we're expecting like this, you know, warm orangey, you know, color. 
So when there's some light blues or some purples in the skin, you really notice that. And that's just like, oh, that's very blue. I'm just going to attack that aspect of that section. When people ask me about skin tones, it's like, usually my comment is, are you warm enough? Because skin is usually a little bit warmer than what you think it is. Especially in the mid-tones. And we're looking through skin, actually a lot of reality. Um, if you're trying to mimic the, the real world. Because the way the light is moving through things, your mid-tones are going to end up being your most saturated. Um, the most saturated part of your figure. Because the shadows, there's not enough light to, uh, to produce that... Um, saturation and then the lights you end up with the actual color of the light kind of mixing with the color of the object which is gonna bring down that saturation as well so your saturation is always almost always strongest in in the mid-tones the connections between the shadows and and the lights Just kind of carving out into the light sections and just kind of pushing forward as I move up the value scale. As you can see, I'm not doing I'm not doing anything tricky. I'm not doing any like fancy brushwork or you know working things in in some kind of random way. I'm just finding the color that I need and then putting it down where it needs to go. Now I I, I will do some fancy brushwork here shortly especially as I get into like the highlights and stuff but as I'm just doing this mid-tone block in I'm just putting it down where it needs to go and of course making some adjustments now when you when you paint this way you can you can actually paint really quickly. This is a very fast way to paint. It just takes a lot of thought and concentration as you go because, you know, you got your brain thinking about all sorts of stuff all at the same time. You can't compartmentalize your values from your temperature or your color story. For a long time, I did uh, like full grisaille underneath my paintings. Do a full grisaille, would do a, a dead layer, which is the blues, and then I would do a yellow layer, and then a red layer, and then all the transparent layers on top of each other. You give. It was really kind of a cool effect. But even when you're done all that, you still have to go through and make all your corrections and. So when I was um, turning professional and going full time, I really was looking for a way to streamline the process and get this done faster. And so that was my solution is I'm just gonna combine all of my steps and do all my steps at the same time. And you see here some uh, tricky brushwork this kind of slashing at these transitions. I'm not really blending them more than I'm 
optically blending. I'm putting like the mid-tones down in between the lights and the darks. So, you know, you have similar colors plop down next to each other. They look blended together when they're actually not. Because I have so, um, the paint is so thin, because I'm not globbing paint down. You really don't want to be blending all that much anyway, because there's not a whole lot of paint there. And every time you blend, it picks paint up. Getting that little curly cue into the hair. My model, his name is, um, is also Ben. So when I say model by Ben, not me, this is not me. In the face, it might be a little descript, but once you see the full painting, then definitely, <laughs> those are not Ben's arms. Well, they are Ben's arms, just a different Ben. But he was such a joy to, to work with um, in the shoot. He and Jason. This is part of my uh, Frith Riff and Ringreich series. If you're not familiar with that, um, uh, with that Nordic myth, you should look into it. It's the idea that Frith Riff is the uh, bravest and most beautiful of his generation, and uh, King Ringreich becomes so uh, smitten with him that he bestows his um, his kingdom, his magic sword, and magic shield, all upon the most beautiful and bravest of his generation. And kind of in the Nordic myth, it's kind of like, it's unclear as to exactly the nature of the relationship, like a father-son type of relationship, except they aren't. I'm just reimagining that as a as a intergenerational love story. Like how else would you end up with the uh the youngest of the king's guard becoming the heir apparent to the throne? Through love. That's something uh That's something that an older established person would do for their younger love interest. This is actually my uh, second time recording this, so I'm not sure what I had uh, said the previous time. Uh, so I may be repeating myself, and I don't care. Sometimes things are meant to be repeated. As I get some of these highlights in, it really kind of transforms. Transforms the figure. I really wanted the beard to be, um, to be kind of like wild and unkempt because it's in a, you know, in a bedroom setting and it's hard to keep your hair all, uh, nice and neat when you're being athletic in the bedroom. important thing these uh, in this moment is getting the silhouette down it's like where the transition comes from him to the figure and as I do that you can really see kind of the unkept quality of the beard and there I'm just kind of just jabbing jabbing into it 
some of that fancy uh, brush work I was talking about. And just little crisscross motions to just kind of give it a uneven feel. Kind of show that it's a lots and lots of little objects and not just one big solid. And kind of uh, mimicking that in the along the hair here as well. You notice that entire ear was just one little stroke. <laughs> It's kind of weird that I left those highlights until the very end. I didn't mean to. I just kind of forgot that they were supposed to be there when I moved from from the yellow side to the blue side. And I'm not being too precious or trying to get everything like too precise. I'm just kind of Close enough is my motto in life. I try to keep these paintings as loose, as loose as I possibly can and still have it look real. That also helps if you're really strategic about what, uh, um, about which sections you're going to push the realism on because you really shouldn't I I don't want to do it in my work to where like the entire thing is completely uh, uh, fully realized so I want to keep like the, the higher rendering because if you're strategic about your, your rendering you can really use it to uh Focus the eye where you want it to go. Infrafrous head is definitely a place that I wanted some high rendering. I think I'm about halfway done at this point on his face. really kind of clean up some edges. Edges are important to my work too. I did realize something happened with my camera right there. It was kind of the saturation and the brightness have just sh shifted. Luckily, that didn't happen in person because, God, I would be, <laughs> all of a sudden, my painting started looking like this. It's like, oh, my God, what happened? Here, trying to get that highlight on the nose was like really challenging. The one thing that I don't want to do in my work is um, idealize. I kind of, especially, you know, you know, if I have somebody of a different, a different ethnic background than me, I don't want to be making changes to them. Like 
why'd you make the Jewish guy's nose smaller? So I don't want to do that. I want to honor people's uh, face shape and as best as I can anyway. So I'm coming back in with some of these uh, darker blues. And then since I have the 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 midtones down in, in the reds already, when I come back through uh, with these darker blues, they really uh, transform to these beautiful purples without me having to do anything. I just dab them in and it just automatically on the on the panel just creates these these beautiful colors. And because I did my blocking, um, my blocking out really well, there's enough paint in there to make these transitions happen. Because if you put too much paint down, then the stabbing in won't do anything to it. And if there's not enough paint, then uh, it won't create all these little transitions either. It's really important to get the exact amount of paint down that you need to create the effects that you want. Here I am shaving down this nose. <laughs> it's all right though. I didn't do it too bad. about 20 some minutes in. I forget how long this video is. I think it's about 40 minutes. So we're about halfway done now. I'm just carving out, coming back through the darks and just pushing them into the midtones. So I've started using um, a, a flake white as uh, my white through the midtones, and the flake white is just awesome in every possible aspect. It's very smooth. The application goes down really well, um, and it also. Uh, is not nearly as opaque as other whites so I can come in with these darkers and uh, dark colors and just kind of push them into the midtones and it works whereas if I was using titanium white it would just kind of bulldoze everything that wasn't titanium white out of its way and get it to change temperatures but getting it to you know trying to darken those values it just uh, does not want to budge but the but the flake white does that quite well the only problem with it is it's made out of lead and is a neurotoxin <laughs> and a particularly bad one too that's right if I go crazy it'll be other people's problems, not mine. I'll just be happy in my craziness. As long as I still can paint. And I think this is a little bit closer to what uh, the painting looks like in reality. There's some reason my camera was going all light and saturated before, but yeah, this is really close. And here I am actually blending. So I'm going through with 
my brush and just kind of dabbing everything and having them all kind of blur together a bit. And because I optically blended earlier, this makes it really easy because I don't have to do, I don't have to like push the paint around to get it to blend because I almost I had it pretty much well optically done anyway. So just these little tabs is going to do it. And it's hard to tell on the video and actually not even fully sped, but just regular. It's hard to tell. But um, when I'm blending, I'm really pushing in the direction the light is going. really trying to pay attention to like which edges are more blurred out and which ones are sharper. So you, you would think that you know blending out is going to make everything um, more blurry but it doesn't. You can use this technique to actually sharpen. You can sharpen your edges doing this as well and all in between, and I'm doing all of it all at once. You can see some of these edges that are just disappearing into nothing, like that one. And then you see some edges like right there, and I'm pushing and creating more. You can really see his facial expression coming through. And I just love this, this very proud of himself. Like he is feeling really good about himself right now. And I just love that idea. You really kind of see those directional strokes a little bit better just right there how I'm doing that. Oh good, that ear was bothering me. I'm glad I got to that. <laughs> it's weird I'm seeing flaws earlier uh, watching it back than I did at the time. I wonder if I tried to go back and paint this, if I would, uh, how much I would uh, uh, change in my process. So uh, the brightest brights are gonna be in this yellow section. So I'm actually just going straight in with some uh, Warm White by Gamblin. And, um, oh, never mind. I'm not going to that process yet. Get the background all blocked in. I need some bigger brushes. It's one of the bigger brushes that I use. But it works really well when you're blocking in. And again, I'm just going darkest to the lightest. And the background on this painting is uh, very dark and very blue. But since again, you know, I have uh, the benefit of Having foresight, because I know how the sun's background turned out really, really well. Exactly as I hoped it would be. And kind of the nature of the way that I paint, um, because the layers are so thin and I'm using uh, a lot of earth tones, like... Uh, uh, burnt umber and burnt sienna and uh, and uh, ochre and all of that uh, as they dry really matte and since I have a lot of that in my dark tones once the dark tones start to dry then it dries really matte and so it's not nearly as dark which is why you have to uh, oil in And then I'll give you a, a better sense of where 
your values truly are. You can kind of see in the face where it's starting to, uh, where it's starting to light up a bit, where the fresh paint behind it is like really much darker. In this section, I really am blending. Because it's in the background, because it's um, not the focus of the painting, I wanted to blend this, get it all nice and mixed up. So it just falls into the background and really highlights the figures. And created a lot of sight lines throughout this painting. You can't really see them here, but uh, Ben here is highly, highly focused. Very much the feature. And just coming back through, because my lightest lights are in that white, in the yellow section, just going through with some of that warm light. I think I'd mentioned it earlier. And it had sunken in, um, or it's uh, the, the painting, the, the paint has set, so I'm able to just dig in on top of it without having too much trouble. So I like that, that the more you dab, it changes the color of your, of your paint. You can just kind of just go with it. And as long as you understand how the, the um, temperature and value of the paint that's on your brush is changing as you're going through, you can just kind of go along, just kind of make it happen. You're not having to stop and mix color or go back to your palette or, you know, you can just live in that moment and just create these strings of joy. I say that, that edge of the nose, ugh, I, I worked with that. It finally came together, but that's such a difficult transition. It's so important. It's not like I can like have that off at all and have it work. It's got to be exact, exact. We're about half an hour in, so yeah, we're heading into the final stretches. I was coming in on the blue section. It's not coming across all that blue, but uh, when you see it in person, this side is definitely uh, one. It's darker than the uh, than the yellow side significantly. You can't tell that in this video, and it is also much much cooler. Oh yeah, I discovered a mistake. So one thing your brain wants to do when it looks at people is it wants to uh, straighten their heads. So if your head is cockeyed, your brain will actually interpret that and straighten it out for you. And it also will turn the figure towards you as well. So that if you see somebody at a three quarter angle and their head is cockeyed, your brain will still be able to recognize them uh, even when they come up and talk to you and their face on. So knowing that, it is very easy as you're trying to paint some uh, someone's portrait that you will start to straighten out their head to be more straight on to you. And so if that's not what you want, then you really have to pay attention and make yourself keep it in the perspective. Keep that head turned away from you. So that's why I had to, had to move that. And as soon as I did that, his nose started to look a little less out of shape because I had turned the chin and not the nose, and so the nose looked super, super strange. But now, now it looks real. Really getting the details into those eyes. The lips look really good. 
And I'm really liking this expression. Very much like my shit don't stink. I love that attitude. In certain contexts, of course. And here I'm getting into some fancy brush work. I just have uh, this little round guy and I'm just like just barely tapping him in. Just barely tapping him in. Just some of these white tones. And creates a really, really soft transition. I think this nose is what gave me the problems. And the reason it was giving me that problem is because um, I had uh, turned the face without realizing it. So when I tried to fix the nose, but the problem wasn't with the nose, it was actually the, uh, the cheek. Now I have to go back in and readjust what I had fixed before in the nose. Honestly, I feel like I waste a lot of time on some aspects. Like, God, I could have done that a lot faster. But, you know, I paint very quickly. So it's like, well, it can't be that ill-conceived being that, you know, I'm still being quite plurific. I think we're coming in in like the last five minutes. So yeah, these highlights, like I really wasn't sure what I was going to do with this section of the beard. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get these highlights in. I think they really did add something special. And I hope I capture this moment because I'm going to get to it in just a moment where I open up his, uh, his right eye. Nope, not yet. It's happening now. It was just amazing. It was just one little dab. And then it went from closed to open. And I just felt so good about myself. Sometimes that's all it takes. If you're trying to do too much. I try not to overdo it. And oil paint's not like a lot of other mediums. You can, um, you can fix pretty much anything. You hear a lot about like losing the freshness or whatever. You can always just bring that back. Just let it dry and go back over it with some, you know, more fresh, vibrant brushwork. So you're never actually stuck. The trick is, is that you put so much work into something and then um, 
it loses its freshness and you're just like, oh, well, you know, I put so much work into this. I don't want to just lose all that work. And so you just accept it. Total sum fallacy, I think that's called. Or it's really better to just, you know, chuck what you have and start again. Well, because you've already put so much work into it. But that is the full painting. And I think that is going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you all again.